Florida, and I'm going to guide you through this meeting. This is the first time that I've done one of these, so I have two requests. One of those requests is that you be patient with my bumbling, and the second request is please refrain from using the terms menhaden, pogey, and bunker, because I see that it causes great confusion. So the first item of business is to approve the agenda. Are there any changes recommended for the agenda? I think what we're going to do with the agenda is we are going to move six and seven around. And so we'll do the fishery management plan review first, and then we'll talk about the spotted sea trout issue after that. Seeing no suggested changes to the agenda, I see it approved by consent. Next thing is approval of our proceedings from our November 2015 meeting. Are there any suggestions or edits for changes there? Seeing none, we see it approved by consent. Next is public comment. We don't have anyone signed up for public comment. Yes, is, there, is, there, is there anybody in the audience that would uh, like to make some public comment on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to item number four. Um, update on progress of Red Drum Benchmark Stock Assessment and Desk Review, and I'll turn that over to Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the Red Drum Technical Committee and Stock Assessment Subcommittee uh, have met uh, several times over the last few months via teleconference to review uh, work, continued work on the uh, stock synthesis, Red Drum, Northern and Southern stock models, uh, and progress on implementing some of the recommendations from the CDAR 44 peer review workshop. Uh, we actually just wrapped up the report this past Monday and sent that to the technical committee, and we will be meeting again via teleconference next Friday uh, to get the uh, to review those documents and to get the technical committee's approval uh, before sending those documents to reviewers for a desk review. Uh, and we anticipate uh, presenting the results of that review and assessment to this board at the May meeting. So if there are any questions on that assessment, I can take those now. Any questions? I guess seeing none, we'll go on to talk about the update on the progress of the Atlantic Croker and Spot Assessment. Yes, thanks again, Mr. Chairman. So for the uh, Spot and Atlantic Croker stock assessment process, uh, we'll actually be holding an assessment workshop in Charleston, South Carolina next week. Um, we'll be reviewing some of the methods and assessment approaches uh, we'll be looking at for uh, both Spot and Croker at that assessment workshop. Uh, and we'll also be having a second uh, assessment workshop uh, for the two species assessment uh, later this summer. And uh, we are still on track to uh, have that, those assessments reviewed uh, through an external ASMSC peer review uh, this fall. So if there are any questions on those assessments, I can take those now. <laughs> any questions? Y'all are making this real easy for my first day. I think now we'll go to fishery management plan review, and we'll expect to have some action items on this. Hi, everyone. I'll be going through the 2015 spot FMP review today. So I'll start with the status of the fishery. Uh, this graph here shows commercial harvest in blue and recreational harvest in orange from 1950 to 2014. Overall, we've seen an increase in landings over the last two years that would be different than the trend we were seeing prior to 2012. Um, total coast by catch is estimated at 8.37 million pounds, an increase of over 2 million pounds from 2013. And this is roughly five, or half a million pounds over the 10-year average. The commercial fishery accounted for roughly 65% of these landings with 5.4 million pounds. And this is more than quadruple the commercial catch in 2012. Virginia landed approximately 74% of commercial harvest, followed by North Carolina. This graph looks at the recreational harvest in millions of fish. The red bars are harvest and the green bars are those spots that were released. In 2014, recreational harvest was 8.7 million fish, and that's up 4 million fish from 2012. Anglers in Virginia were responsible for roughly 45% of the total, and this was followed by North Carolina and then Maryland. 
The estimated number of spot released by recreational anglers in 2014 was 3.75 million fish, which is significantly lower than the amount that was released in 2013, but it is on par with the time series average. So in terms of a stock assessment, we don't have a complete coastwide stock assessment, but as Jeff just mentioned, we're working on one now that should be done at the end of the year. In the interim, we monitor the stock through the traffic light approach as stipulated in addendum one. And just as a reminder, the addendum sets a threshold of 30%, which is that black line you see on the graph here, and that represents moderate concern for the fishery. So this graph here has actually a li been a little bit revised than what is in your packet for meeting materials, and I'll be putting this graph into the document when it goes on our website. Um, the reason it has been revised is that the old graph showed very high proportion of red in 2014, and that seemed a little counterintuitive to me, considering we had very high landings in 2014. So I asked that it be redone, and as a result, the proportion of red did decrease. So now that um, the, hub, the harvest composite index is not tripped for 2014. This next one here shows abundance composite index, um, and this is comprised of the survey data. The abundance index did, tri did trigger in 2014 with a mean red proportion of 43.5%. Overall, management measures weren't triggered, and that's because you need both harvest and the abundance index to be over that 30% threshold. Um, so there is no need or uh, no trigger for management action at this point. In terms of the status of management, we're currently under the omnibus amendment, but there are no specific regulations in that for the recreational or commercial sector. And then we have addendum one, which stipulates the traffic light approach. So all states are found to be in compliance. Uh, for de minimis, a uh, state qualifies for de minimis if its past three-year average of combined commercial and recreational catch is less than 1% of the coastwide average. Uh, Georgia requested and qualifies for de minimis, de minimis status. So the PRT recommends the board approve the 2015 spot FMP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for Georgia. Are there any questions for Megan Lewis? No, sir. Just going to make a motion that we approve the 2015 review, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for Georgia. Let's make sure there's no questions. Any questions? Okay, and Pat, Pat seconds the motion. Any discussion about the motion? So the motion is to approve the 2015 spot FMP review, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for Georgia. Motion by Dr. Daniel and seconded by Pat Gear. Pat Gear. Yeah. I'm flattered by that because <laughs> we both. We're both from the same state, and we both went to the same college, but it's Mr. Gear. Are there any objections to the motion? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Okay, the next item is about spotted sea trout. If you remember, in our meeting in November 2015, we made the recommendation, we passed a motion that said that we were going to recommend to the policy board to withdraw the spotted sea trout FMP, and since that time has come to our attention that there were some unforeseen consequences of doing that. And with that, I'll let Lewis talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for jumping the gun on that at the last meeting. I was unaware of some changes that had been made at home that actually removed my proclamation authority from being able to re-implement um, the management measures without the federal or ASMSC plan nexus. So it would have actually defeated the whole purpose of my intent, at least, in trying to get the, the board to, to take that action. So in the meantime, we're working towards restoring that proclamation authority for me with, with spotted sea trout. Um, but at this present time, I think it would be in our best interest to wait um, until such time that that uh, that, that those changes have been made, um, particularly so that we don't negatively impact, number one, our fishery, but also Virginia's fishery, would really concern me about that. So there was some suggestion um, about perhaps moving forward with an addendum to perhaps modify some of the current restrictions on spotted sea trout. 
in in thinking about that and talking to some people i wonder if that would draw more attention to this than we really want to number one um and number two they're just so there's so many different issues and things in the various states that really I, the only thing i could really see that we might be able to do is move forward with a with an increase in the size limit to be consistent with the smallest size limits we have which i believe would be 14 inches but I'm not sure that really gets us much bang for the buck. So my, my suggestion at this point, whether we need a motion or not, would simply be to, to table this, this issue until, until we're able to sort through all the, all the issues that I'm dealing with at home. Are there questions to Lewis about this issue or any comments? Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So <clears throat> um, I had committed at the, at the last meeting to take a look at spotted sea trout tagging studies with a view toward showing or determining how much uh, interjurisdictional migration that they exhibited. And those are on the order of 5 to 8 percent, you know, so it's, it is pretty low. And most of those are between adjacent states like North Carolina, Virginia, or South Carolina and North Carolina. So, so it is fairly low. So. Um, I did vote in favor of the motion last time for biological reasons because, you know, they, they do show a lot of fidelity to their natal estuaries. And then I had talked to Lewis and, and wondered whether or not a, uh, an addendum just to raise the size limit to 14 inches would be a useful uh, approach to take. But I understand that Delaware still has, I guess, the 12 inch size limit in place, which is what's presently in the ASMSC plan. So the only thing I'll add is that, you know, if you did decide to pursue an addendum, I can't remember, maybe uh, Megan can help me, whether or not we updated the spotted sea trout habitat section when we did that omnibus amendment for other South Atlantic state federal species. If we didn't, then if we were to pursue an addendum, it would probably be a useful thing to update that uh, habitat section of that plan. Yeah, give me one second to look through that plan and I can respond to that, Wilson. In the meantime, are there other questions, Robert? No question, Mr. Chairman. Bunker. <clears throat> but a comment, Pogi. And then finally, let me throw in Menhaden just for good measure. Um, I, I certainly understand um, Lewis's intention, um, both in terms of making the original motion as well as the situation he finds himself in. Um, but based on, you know, among other things, the information Wilson has just shared with us, I think long term, I'm very interested in decoupling to the degree that we could um, this um, very parochial species um, as we see it. Um, and I will just say for the uh, uh, for the board's information, we've been approached by some of our constituents uh, back home to really kind of take a long term look at uh, at uh, at spotted sea trout back in the uh, fall we had a, a constituent said you know i've been fishing for 70 years it's a game fish in south carolina so there's no commercial landings no reported commercial landings and uh you know his point um was you know a, what is now a trophy fish you know would have been a, a throwaway back in the early days of his youth and so it's really caused us to look at uh, really long-term visioning what we want that spotted sea trout fishery to look like um and um love dancing with you don't get me wrong but if we have the opportunity to go on our own and maybe develop a trophy fishery or look at some of the um, innovative mechanisms that are being used to manage that fishery from around the really the southeast that we'd like that opportunity so uh, um, certainly don't object to um, uh, holding off on where we're going but i think long term would be interested in in being able to um, uh, perform more solo act uh, with spotted sea trout management Menhaden. Wilson, just to answer your question, there is a, it looks like it's a pretty detailed habitat section in the document now. It goes over the habitat of the different life stages and critical habitat. So uh, that was from 2012. Lewis and then Wilson. Yeah, I would, I would just ask if the if the other members of the board have a similar feeling about this issue than as Robert does, because I, I certainly agree with what you're saying, certainly would like to do the same thing. That, that would help me 
move this along quicker um, and, and really and try, maybe try to get something into the short session based on some studies that I've got to report on in the next couple of months, might be able to get that moving quicker if there's a general interest. I know there's still the issue with, with uh, Delaware. I don't know how to deal with that issue. But aside from that specific issue, does, do most of the board members feel the same way as Robert? Because if they do, that, that, that helps me. Uh, Wilson. Well, not, not to that point, but <clears throat> uh, another possible reason for tabling it now, as I understand, Lewis, you may want to address this, but I think there's a, a new genetic study that's going to be done that might shed some more light on you know, differences between spotted sea trout uh, along the coast. Some of the previous studies suggested that there were some significant genetic differences between at least the stocks in the Carolinas, I guess, or North Carolina maybe in some of the southern stocks. And, and I would just say to the point that Robert was making with regard to, to management, I think this particular species is very similar to the anadromous species in that you know, management for them probably ought to be at least estuary based. And so from that perspective, it's very appropriate species for, for state based management. And then one last comment is that I would encourage us all to consider, you know, in addition to the, the things we've already talked about with regard to plan withdrawal, whether or not there would be any other reason to keep it in place. And I don't know from an enforcement perspective, is there some utility to having, you know, a, a statewide plan in place? Um, because some of the issues, you know, you, you could address through an addendum, others you might not be able to. So I would just encourage us all to, to think about that, too. Pat, here. Okay. Lewis, we were very supportive of you. In fact, uh, Georgia just re increased their size limit to 14 inches. And in the public hearing, um, it, it was there seemed like there was going to be a lot of opposition, and there really wasn't. It was just a lot of noise. Most people were supportive. What, what a lot of people were saying afterwards, so they would almost put, they would almost like to see a slot limit. Now, what that slot limit would be, we don't know. But um, you know, taking it off the commission's purview, you know, we're working very closely with South with Southern Flounder. You, know, you came to the board and asked, and we're working very closely with everybody, and it seems to be going along fairly smoothly and we're going to have a, probably a stock assessment on that at some point so you know I, I think you know I agree with what everyone has said so far we should you know move forward with this Joe thank you mr. chair yeah I, I, as, as I said in November I think I'm most comfortable with this since we we have been working with North Carolina and Virginia has a uh, a, a part in that joint stock assessment and I think Going forward, as long as uh, you know the two states are working together, as Wilson pointed out, uh, there are some genetic studies trying to get to are even with a mixed stock are there are there estuary uh, you know is is there uh, site fidelity to these estuaries? But either way, I think as long as the two of us are working together, that that really gets to it. Roy. Mr. Chairman, I'm a little confused. Uh, listening to what Robert said, um, that they're contemplating some uh, perhaps innovative methods for managing their spotted sea trout population, I don't understand why why the coastal, uh, the South Atlantic plan for spotted sea trout, um, what advantage there would be to to doing away with that, as as everyone knows well, you can be more restrictive but not less restrictive than the plan. And frankly, the plan isn't very restrictive now. Um, what are the advantages to abandoning the spotted sea trout plan to pursue the type of thing that Robert had in mind? Robert? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Roy, it's not so much an advantage of, of abandoning this, this group dance. Uh, as much as it is kind of a long-term uh, issue, I, I think, quite frankly, of credibility. You know, where where does the commission spend its resources um, in terms of managing interstate um, fisheries? And you know, with the information that that Wilson just provided, um, w we intend to move forward with with this um, look and this analysis and this discussion with our recreational anglers on spotted sea trout, and um, and and quite confident that we won't come back with anything that's. Um, 
Uh, if anything, we intend to be uh, probably a little bit more restrictive um, with the rains that we had, uh, the flooding that many of you all saw reported back in the fall. Uh, it has been an epic spotted sea trout year in South Carolina. Um, but having said that, you know, I think people have seen that, wow, this fishery can really be different. So my interest is in simply not specific to spotted sea trout, but the question of if this is a parochial fish, to use my term, if this is a parochial fish, why are we spending commission resources managing it? That's all. So it's not an objection. And uh, um, I just think it's a question of um, are we better served by spending our time and our efforts on species that are maybe a little less parochial, like eels and like red drum uh, and some of these other species that where there are clear um, connections uh, across state borders? Thanks. Dr. Daniel. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just remind, we talked about this the last time, but I guess my biggest concern and the reason that I brought this up in the very first place was the concern about being more restrictive than the federal government. And that, that is, a, that is a, a position that my state is taking on many issues. And so it, my concern, my main concern, was in making sure that I wasn't all of a sudden told you, gotta, you can't be more restrictive than the AS, ASMFC plan, which only requires a 12-inch minimum size limit. And if we were, to requ if we were required to do that, then it would be devastating to the North Carolina and Virginia population. I don't know that it would affect the southern states much at all, but just based on all the tagging work we've done, there's very little interchange south of North Carolina, but there's a lot into Virginia. And, and, and so that's, that was the biggest concern. And so while I recognize that there is an issue in another state, I think the potential for North Carolina having to go back to the original plan requirements would be devastating to the to the resource and that's my primary concern Wilson well it's it's a fine point I suppose but but that you know the ASMFC plan is not a federal plan I, I don't know that that would be perceived that way by the public I see Lewis nodding in, in a sense, uh, you know, the courts have determined that ASMFC is not a federal entity, so the plan isn't federal and it isn't subject to Section 7 consultations and other things like that. But, but to that point, you know, I still think that, you know, the solution maybe, at least as far as the size limit thing goes, would be just to put an addendum in place that address that size limit issue. And again, that doesn't solve Delaware's problem at all. Okay, so right now we are scheduled, I believe, tomorrow to talk about this at the policy board unless we take some sort of action here today. So I would suggest that probably we do need a motion if we're going to delay. Robert. Mr. Chairman, having voted on the prevailing side um, at the annual meeting to recommend that the policy board rescind the interstate fishery management plan for spotted sea trout, I would move that we, Menhaden, help me out. I would move that we table the postpone. motion. Postpone. Postpone. Thank you, Ms. Kearns. Postpone um, the motion that was passed in November 2015 to withdraw the Spotted Sea Trout FMP. Are we going to have some time certain on the postponement? Mr. Robert. Chairman, it is, it is, Joe's not here. <laughs> it is my intent to uh, postpone this indefinitely to give some of our jurisdictions time to wrestle with this. Um, so that's the reason it's a motion to postpone and not a motion to table. Any discussion on the motion? Lewis second. Any discussion? Robert. Mr. Chairman, I think point of order, I believe this will require a two-thirds vote. I would have to look to Tony about that, whether that's true or not. You've stumped me. 
because you're not rescinding the action. You've postponed it indefinitely, which is like rescinding, but using it differently. But we could just to be safe if you wanted to. <laughs> I need Dennis. Any more discussion before we figure out what we're doing here? Okay, I kind of sense that maybe there's not complete um, consensus on this issue. So without any further discussion, those in favor of the motion, raise their right hand, please. Thank you. Abstentions? No votes? Maybe I should ask, how about any nays? Raise your right hand, please. Okay, I have motion passes 11 to 0 to 0 to 0. So I think we have our two-thirds majority, whether we need it or not. So the next item that we have on our agenda is election of vice chair right now that position is empty do we have any nominations for vice chair pat i'd like to nominate dr lewis daniel of south of north carolina as our sorry about that as our new vice chair of the south atlantic board do we have a second have a second from malcolm are there any objections for lewis serving as vice chair Seeing none, Lewis, welcome to the South Atlantic Board again. Oh, thank you. Red Drum. Is there any other business before the board today? Yes, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so besides being Lewis's proxy on a couple of management boards here, um, one of the other hats I wear is chair of the South Atlantic Council. And I just wanted to bring to the board's attention, um, I guess, an issue that everyone is going to be having with COBIA. Um, I just wanted to let folks know um, the South Atlantic is a management lead for COBIA along the East Coast. Um, there were some changes to COBIA management uh, beginning in late 2015, the management unit used to be the east coast of Florida through New York, but genetic work done during the latest stock assessment indicated that the, um, the stock boundary between the Gulf and Atlantic stocks of Cobia was actually at the Florida-Georgia border. So right now, the Atlantic coast uh, Cobia stock in ACL applies to that area from Georgia north through New York. Um, for folks who fished for Cobia over the past year, you know that it was pretty much an epic year for Cobia. Um, the ACL for that species, I think, was 600, or the, it, it was an epic year recreationally for Cobia. The recreational ACL for that species is 630,000 pounds, and we blew it by almost double. It was 1.5 million pounds. Um, the accountability measures for that for that uh, species on the recreational side do not include an in-season closure when the ACL is met or projected to be met. Instead, um, the fisheries service calculates the uh, length by which the following year's season might need to be reduced in order to constrain harvest to the ACL. So it is pretty clear to those of us around the South Atlantic Council table, we had a lengthy discussion about this at our December Council meeting, that um, there's going to be a shortened season for Cobia. I don't know when the last time was we had a shortened season for Cobia. Um, the South Atlantic Council is going to be considering a regulatory amendment to lower the bag limit from two fish to one fish. It's been two fish for a number of years. I know that other states in jurisdictions. I believe the east coast of Florida has had a one fish cobia limit in state waters for a while. Virginia went to, I think, a one fish limit in April of 2014. Um, I think there were a number of factors that led to this. Uh, the average size of the fish, if you take a look at the, the preliminary MRIP data, um, was almost 10 pounds higher than it was in 2014. So I just say that because I know that this is a really important recreational fishery for uh, 
many charter for higher captains. Um, and Robert, I neglected to include South Carolina. I know you all have some legislation moving through as well to um, reduce the, the bag limit, I think, for one of your subpopulations to one fish as well. We've asked our staff in North Carolina to conduct a similar analysis to see um, how North Carolina moving down to one fish limit might impact the length of the season for this year. Um, preliminary indications are that most people don't limit out on cobia. So a one fish limit isn't necessarily going to do a whole lot. Um, but I wanted to bring that to folks' attention. And, I, and one of the big things here is that uh, I think if you look at the two separate ACLs that um, for the east coast of Florida and then for the remainder of the Atlantic coast, um, the, the Georgia through New York portion um, of the ACL has kind of gone up and down and uh, alternately exceeded and been under our new ACL over the years, if you look at those landings. And really the big, the big players in that fishery are North Carolina and Virginia. Um, Virginia topped everybody in 2015 with, with harvest, and it tends to be mostly a wave three fishery for most folks. Virginia also has some, some, a significant chunk of harvest in wave four. So um, John Carmichael is here from the South Atlantic Council. John, I don't know if there's anything else you might want to add. I think that sort of encapsulates our conversation from December, but I did just want to make folks aware of it. Thank you. No, I don't have anything else to add, Michelle. I think you did a great job covering it. Thanks. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A question for Michelle and a comment. Michelle, the fishing year is, Jan is a calendar year, correct? Um, just for the board's um, information, today uh, the South Carolina Senate Committee on Fish, Game, and Forestry, um, uh, a member of whom, uh, uh, Ronnie Cromer, is the legislative commissioner, um, has passed legislation onto the South Carolina Senate floor that would create a southern cobia management zone in South Carolina state waters south of 32 degrees 31 minutes. Um, within that um, southern cobia management zone, um, the possession limit would, uh, from June 1st through April 30th, would be one fish per person, three fish per boat. During the month of May, it would be no possession allowed um, at all. So, Michelle, just I know that um, this is based on some genetic work that our staff um, found that uh, was accepted as part of the latest stock assessment. Um, that those uh, there's a very unique fishery, inshore fishery in South Carolina. Um, the, the House of Representatives in, in South Carolina has also passed similar measures. So um, both of those bills are on the way to the floor, and we are optimistic and hopeful that they will pass. But it will raise the question of whether those fish that um, are caught inside get counted against that, um, that coast-wise DPS, and something that um, we're very, very concerned about. Um, again, in terms of trying to, to keep that fishery open. And last, I'll mention that uh, in South Carolina, Cobia caught in South Carolina state waters may not be sold, bartered, trade, or otherwise in commerce. They're game fish. Thank you. Any questions for John or Michelle or further discussion on this issue? Lewis. Yeah, this, this came as a you know, little bit of a surprise um, to me because, I mean, of all, of all the fish that we manage, We've been very conservative all along with cobia, um, with a two fish limit, but for both commercial and recreational fisheries where commercial fisheries exist. So it's concerning to me that, that we're seeing this type of thing, especially um, with the increasing size and, and the size limits that we currently have. Um, but I am concerned about the impacts of this closure, um, really as much for the north of North Carolina, particularly Virginia, if you're looking at a June 15th closure, um, that's a major chunk of the of the of the Virginia fishery. Um, a lot of times our fishery is slowing down by then, but I would imagine that's pretty pretty hefty hefty hit for north of North Carolina. So um, dis disappointing, I guess, is the main thing I can say about it, and certainly would encourage us to continue to try to collect as much information as we possibly can for an updated stock assessment because there's got to be something that uh, I, w I would think that maybe more information might help us out of this out of this fix Joe 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think you know it, it's been a it's been a growing uh, in popularity recreational fishery for us. Uh, t just to correct Michelle, that we've had the one fish recreational bag limit for a long time. It's a two fish commercial. Um, slowing that fishery down isn't going to be easy. The only further discussions that our uh, recreational guys have been having is having a boat limit, uh, capping it at um, six or four fish per boat. Um, that there certainly hasn't been any talk about a season, but we have let them know that Virginia alone more than doubled the, the uh, ACL for, for Georgia through New York. So uh, definitely something's coming. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, not to belabor this, but I think the, the reason that this is a big surprise is that previously Florida was lumped in with the rest of the state, so you had all of that additional ACL, and now, you know, Florida, it's been determined that Florida's fishing on the Gulf stock as, a, as opposed to, you know, the Atlantic population, so that removes a huge chunk, and if you look at the, the ACL for Florida, um, Florida's cobia harvest has been you know, reasonably under maybe 20 to 30 percent um, almost every year of the ACL that they have now. So again, because of these changes in the, the stock boundaries, this is why we're in, in this pickle. Yeah. Trust me, we don't want to be here. Anything else on this issue? Seeing none, is there any other business that we need to discuss? Hearing silence, is there a motion to adjourn? Pat, in a second. Now we're we're adjourned. The Tatog board was scheduled to start at 4:45. Um, why don't we start at 4:30? Promptly. Thank you.